my cousin Bruce. Old Father Time is a slippery fellow, very hard to pin down. Poets, mystics, philosophers, and scientists have all tried, but he eludes their grasp. For me, the good Dr. Einstein has come to the closest when he said time is relative. I can relate to that as my timeline is full of relatives, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Lots and lots of cousins, and particularly male cousins. Around the end of World War II, our village brought forth many baby boys. My father blamed it on something in the village water, which he called the Wood Wiggly Well Water. But I believe it was the village trying to restore itself while grieving over all the young men who went overseas during the war. Many who came back wounded in body and soul, or not at all. In any case, there were lots of male cousins in our immediate family, nine in all. Our home in the village on beautiful Lake Rosso was the natural gathering place during the hot, humid Ontario summers. Relatives would come there to holiday, and our house was often filled to overflowing. Wall-to-wall -wall boys in our bedroom in bunk beds, cots, and on the floor. My mother recalled having to close our bedroom door to try to prevent the stench of ripe running shoes from overpowering the household. I loved having many cousins to roam with on the rocky ridges and to swim, fish, and boat on the lake. Of course, any pack of wild animals needed an alpha male, and in our case, it was Cousin Bruce. He stood out from the rest of us as he was several years older, and he looked different, taller because of his age, wiry, dark complexion with curly hair. He was a born leader and always took charge of any group of cousins he was with. And he was always the first to try to succeed in any activity we undertook. The first to master a backflip off our homemade diving board, the first to get up on water skis, and the first to challenge the most difficult climbs up the cliffs behind our house. And he was also a trickster, the Loki of our Viking horde. One day he was pioneering a difficult climb up our cliffs. We were waiting expectantly at the top for his grinning face to pop up over the edge. But he didn't appear, and there was no answer to our concerned calls. We hurried to the bottom of the cliff by a safe route and found him sprawled on the rocks. It appeared he had fallen and was injured. We asked if there was anything we could do, and he replied in a weak voice that if we would feed him our stash of licorice candy, he might feel better. As we doled out our candy piece by piece, he slowly revived and made a full recovery. I was convinced for years that licorice had magic healing powers and always kept some handy for any emergency. Bruce was always generous with his knowledge and skills, and in many ways he was like a big brother to me. He taught me how to fish, to catch and hit a baseball, to water ski and other necessary boy skills. And then of course there was sex. Sex education was non-existent in those days, so we learned about the birds and the bees from the worst possible source, other boys. Cousin Bruce undertook to explain all the mysteries to me, and he felt it important that I be exposed to the female form. Every summer, our family would attend the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto. On its midway, among the many rides and attractions was the burlesque show. That fateful year, Cousin Bruce was 16, the legal age to attend this notorious show, but I was only 12. However, I was tall for my age and I already was shaving. But I think Cousin Bruce told the ticket seller that I had a terminal illness and the show was a last treat for his dying younger brother. In any case, we found ourselves in front seats for the spectacle. I'm sure the show was quite tame compared to later versions, but for two young boys with raging testosterone, it was pretty hot stuff. I remember we had to take several rides on the roller coaster afterwards to calm down. As we grew older, we drifted apart, but we still met during family gatherings. He would show up with a flashy girlfriend and an even flashier car. Then Bruce married the love of his life, Brenda Lee, and they had a son, Mark. Although he seemed to settle down somewhat, he still loved a good time. It was, all, it was at one of his parties where I was introduced to marijuana. 
I never developed a taste for it, but once again, Cousin Bruce was encouraging me to stretch my boundaries. We saw less of him after we moved to BC, but whenever we visited Ontario, he would welcome us warmly with a barbecue at his cottage and a memory-filled boat ride on the lake. In later years, his health began to fail. He had heart problems, perhaps due to his lifestyle or the unfortunate Wood family genes. The last time I saw him, he was very ill with cancer, but we had a good time remembering old times and sharing stories of our adventures together. We talked about getting together next time we came east, but I think we both knew it wouldn't happen. I kissed him goodbye and cried my way home. He died a month later and his ashes were scattered in his beloved Lake Rosso. Now as Kronos marches unstoppably ahead, I spend more time looking back on his path and my brief moment in deep time. All the twists and turns of my life, births and deaths, celebrations and tragedy, but mostly I remember love and gratitude. I thank Cousin Bruce for his lifelong friendship and being a big brother, for all the skills he taught me and for encouraging me to stretch my boundaries, although not always in the most positive directions. I would say to him now, rest in peace, but I know that's not his style. I'm sure wherever he is, he's not sitting still, but is reaching out for new adventures and entertaining his companions with endless stories and jokes. And one day he'll share them again with me. <laughs>